The Boy Who Saved Baseball by John Ritter. Essential question. How do the media influence how people feel about events? Local landowner Doc Altenheimer has promised his neighbors in Dillon Town that he won't sell his lands to a group of developers headed by Alabaster Jones on one condition. Young Tom Gallagher's baseball team, the Dillon Town Wildcats, will have to do what they never done before, beat the all-star team from the camp down in the Lakeville Mesa. By now, droves of reporters and photographers and television crews roamed the grounds. The dirt roadway cutting through Doc's land and heading to the ballpark was jammed both sides with satellite trucks, microwave trucks, radios, vans, and SUVs all around the ball field. News crews set up lawn chairs, coolers, tripods, and umbrellas. Some of the townspeople showed up with cookies and ice-cold lemonade berry tea for the press, serving a few opinions to them as well. After he finished hitting, Tom heard one Los Angeles newscasters beginning his interview with Mrs. Glidson by saying, Folks, something phenomenal is happening in America today. There are more baseball games across the nation tonight than people have seen in many years. From little hamlets like this one to the last weed filled vacant lots in cities, everywhere the Wild West showdown flavor of this big game has fired up interests and imaginations all over this land. Just focus on your hitting and fielding, Delgado reminded everyone as the team finished its second round of batting practice. Hitting, fielding. Then came the sports network truck, and the players stopped what they were doing and stared as it all sank in. The Dillon Town Wildcats were going national. Don't pay any attention, Delgat called from the pitcher's mound. Crying out loud, they got nothing better to do than hound a bunch of kids. Tom hustled out and sat atop the old stone wall in the right field, pretending to be taking a break while he spied on the guy from the sports network. How long is he going to pitch fella? He asked Tom. One more hitter, then we are done. The reporter turned to a man with a camera on his shoulder. Stepping out of the huge wild truck. Right, only one more better. Get down there. Then he slapped at his shirt pocket, retrieving a notebook and a pen. What's your name, partner? How old are you? What is it like to have a legend like El Gato Loco coaching your squad? Tom wanted to answer every question, but the last one reminded him that he needed to stay focused. Sorry, I can't talk now. Then he couldn't help himself. He had to know. Is that why you are here? All because of him? Oh no, don't you see, kid? This big game, your whole situation here has caught the attention of the entire nation. It's David versus Goliath. It is loyalty versus the big bucks. The small market team fighting for its life against the big money boys who want to come in and bulldoze right over them. It's a metaphor for the entire game of baseball. It is. I'm telling you, buddy, it's more than a metaphor. This could be 
in Meta 5. With that, he stabbed the pen back into his pocket, folded the notebook and ran toward the cameraman, followed by another guy wrapped in headgear and holding a furry microphone on a pole. Luckily for the report and for everyone in the stands, the last batter was Cruz, because he put on a show. Ramon, he called out, this one's for you. On the next pitch, he served up a low line into left field, two steps to the right of Ramon. Maria, get ready, he yelled, and the next one, a sharp ground ball, sizzled down the first baseline. Maria snagged it on the short hop. The crowd would at how easily she made the play. By the time Cruz called Tom's name and set him deep against the right field wall, hoots and whistles ripped out of the stands for both hitter and fielder. More than that, between pitches, Thorne now heard a definite buzz of surprise, of discovery and awe. What are you feeding them for breakfast, Gallagher? A box of wealthies and a pound of nails? Every hitter had done well that day better than usual. The fielders had all displayed fundamental improvement even over yesterday, but Cruz show was full of flair and finesse. He could not miss. Like a pool player, he called his shots, hitting any pitch, high or low, toward any player, hitting the ball as if it were standing still. Finally, the awesome display seemed to be sinking into the minds of the fans in the stands, particularly those like Doc, who'd been there since Monday. The ballpark became a canyon of quiet, save for Cruz's roll call and the slap of the ball on his maple wood bat. Frankie turned too. Frankie charged the hot grounder, stabbed it, tossed it to Tara at second, who relayed it to Maria at first. Smooth as Molly de Chocolate. Again, the crowd called out its admiration. Tom felt a giddy lightheadedness as he watched. For the first time, he felt happy to be here. Tara, running back to second, smiled and gave him thumbs up. At the end of practice, the low voices in the dug out and the serious looks of quiet confidence on the faces of the other players only convinced Tom's suspicious that they felt it too. We got half a chance, said Ramon. Yeah, added Rachel. There it was. The team's two quietest player had spoken the words no one else had dared to say. Grab all your stuff, Delgado growled, bringing a bucket of balls in front of the mound. We're going to jog out of here, and if those reports come swarming around, well, you know the drill. The players rose and filled out of the dugout. They started through the crown and back to camp, except for one. Tom lingered behind sitting alone on the old pine bench. He wanted to savor the thrill of this moment. He wanted to allow everything that had happened to sink in. He let his thoughts fly loose, like leaves in the wind, like sagebrush weaving past his face as he ran through the hillside chaparral. Then he reached for the sports bag next to his feet pulled out his dream sketcher and began to write. Images of newscasters, landowners, outsiders and locals who came to root or gloat, hate or berate, 
filled the movie screens of his mind. He painted the scenes in drawings and word pictures as fast as he could scratch. This awkward, ten membered, twin legged caterpillar of a team cocooned for days in the school library and on a sunken baseball field was now breaking out into butterfly beauty, putting on a show, catching everyone's eyes. Tom pushed his pen along the paper, capturing the moment. He could still hear the roar and drum beats. He could hear footsteps. He looked up. There stood Alabaster Jones. Analyze the text. Metaphor. A metaphor shows how two very unlike things are similar. How does the author use this figure of speech to describe the theme on this page? Well, Tom Gallagher, he said, just the man I'm looking for. He descended the dugout steps. You boys must think you are pretty smart. Tom only stared, afraid even to blink or breathe. Yes, sir, Mr. Jones continued. I heard all about what you and the Mexican boy did. Think you are some clever muchachos, don't you? Tom managed a slight shrug. Mr. John stepped closer, lowering his face into Tom's and grabbed the neck of his t-shirt. You ride off and bring back that no good disgrace of a human being to coach this team of miserable misfits. Get him to show you a little something about hitting, huh? Speak up! Mr. Delgado is not a disgrace. He has a lot of grace. The man twisted his fists, tightening Tom's shirts around his neck. Shut up! Now! I'm only saying this once, so listen good. If by hocus or by pocus you happen to win tomorrow and this land deal falls through, you will sincerely regret it. I have associates in this town who promise me that they will personally shut down Scrubble Community School, fire the staff and make all you Kids hike down and back each day to that Lakeview Mesa school. If things don't go as planned. And why would we all do that? Simple lack of funds, my boy. It's big tax dollar. You kids are playing with. Big money all around. Do you understand? He did. Stanley Tom could see a whole chain of events, like dominoes falling weapons slap into each other. Either the white cats lose tomorrow or Tom's parents lose their jobs. Then maybe even their home. Compared to that, a few houses up on the hill didn't seem so bad. Mr. Jones must be read the understanding on Tom's face. He let go of his shirt and smiled. Good, he said, because I can cause you more hurt than a heart attack. He grinned so white. His sunburn lips turned white. Tom stared back, blinking hard. But if Tom had learned anything during the past week, he'd learn when he had to speak up and when it was better to be silent. And now was a time to speak. We are not trying to hurt you, said Tom. We don't have anything against you at all. Why are you trying to hurt us? Oh, you poor, poor boy. Listen, if you win the game, you'll be hurting me far more than what I could ever do to you. And I mean right here. He tapped his white sport jacket on the left side of his chest. In my wallet. Then Mr. John's face seemed to change, turning softer. Worry rose in his eyes. You see, son, I was once a lot like you. I was young, I had star in my eyes. But what you don't understand is that in the game of life, 
money wins. Brains can only take you so far. Talent barely gets you in the door these days. But this, he held up his hand and rubbed his thumb against his first two fingers. This opened more doors than dynamite. With this, you have instant respect, instant power. Mr. Jones turned, but he did not leave. He looked off toward Rattlesnake Ridge as if imagining what all this land would be like after he was done with it. Remember, he said, without money and the wish for even more money, Columbus never would say to America, then where would we all be today? Think about that. Analyze the text. Understanding characters. How do Tom's feeling about winning the game change after he talks to Alabaster Jones? Why do they change? Under the stars that Friday night, all of the players joined in the wheel spoke circle, and all eyes were wide open. Who could sleep with the weight of the fate of the town squeezing down on them? Okay, we could, but he'd had three burritos grunts, four slices of watermelon, and a mango after catching batting practice all afternoon. No one expects us to win, said Clifford, lying with his knees up and hands behind his back. I think somebody's going to be real surprised, Ramon agreed. My dad came by this morning saying, don't worry, this game doesn't even matter. Sooner or later, this whole place will be houses and weight lane freeways. I just smiled and said, yeah, dad, we know. That's what the mayor said too, Frank added. But when he was watching betting practice today, he was white as a tortilla. Yes, Cruz agreed, but I think his true color was alabaster. Right, Maria? What are you going to say to him after we ruin his plans? Tom's gut clenched. Hey, look you guys, Maria answered. Don't get overconfident. Remember, bearing practice is one thing. But in a game, especially this one, is different. There is a lot of pressure. She's right, said Ramon. But I think Cruz and Clifford are too. The way I see it, as long as we think we have a chance, we have a chance. Tom kept silent. His mind was still frozen under the snake eyes of a man named Jones who loomed above him like a viper over a rat. What did he expect Tom to do? Tell Cruz and everyone to throw the game? Tom was just the bench guy, the reserve player. Even if he got into the game, which would only happen if one team was way ahead of the other, he could strike out and make an arrow or two, but big deal. It would hardly affect the game. Maybe, he thought, he could coach first and trip everyone as they run the bases. Or maybe he could go out to the scoreboard with a mural and shine sunlight into all the batter's eyes. But he hated his thoughts. In fact, he was tired of thinking. Tom, said Cruz. What do you think? Boom went his heartbeat. About what? About the neural receptors inside our brains. What? Okay then, are we going to win tomorrow? Oh, I don't know. It's up to you guys. Up? Said Frankie. Wrong answer. Well, he doesn't know. It was Maria coming to Tom's defense. No one does. We spent three days swinging at the same stupid pitch a million times 
but it was in the library. What about real life? What about it? asked Clifford. You saw us today. We smashed the chips and dip out of the ball. So, Rachel rustled inside her bag as she flipped over to her stomach. I mean, I don't know what happened to us in the library. If we got hypnotized or reprogrammed or brainwashed or what? All I know is we can't forget we are human beings. And human beings have control over their thoughts. And as long as we concentrate on doing our best, we shouldn't worry about winning or losing. She paused, her voice lowered to a whisper. I just believe that when people do things with the good intentions, good things happen. I like when Tom and Cruz rode off to see Del Gato. But when we do stuff out of fear, bad things happen. She looked around. A lot of people are afraid of what might happen tomorrow. But we can't be. Then whatever happens will turn out okay. Even if we feel loose? asked Frank. Even if we feel loose, I mean, from where we are, losing may look like a total disaster. Like we just accidentally busted down someone's wall. Though he couldn't see her, Tom could hear the smile in her voice. But you know, we only see it from here. How does it look from the hawk's nest or from the stars? No one said a word. Everyone, even Tom, searched the night sky, roamed the other, bouncing around between the moon, the stars, and the eucalyptus tree. From treetop, from the hawk's perch, Tom thought about the game, the town, the hillsides. In a million years, a short time, really, in space years, Would it even matter whether they won or lost? In a thousand? What about a hundred? Who could say? But he knew one thing. Rachel was right. He'd seen it too many times. When he froze up from fear, he did stupid things. Like never talking to Doc about the ball field. And when he let his mind fly above the fear, he saw hitting a baseball as just another form of GPS tracking. No matter if his parents got fired and his family had to move, no matter what trouble Alabaster Jones might cause, Tom determined that tomorrow he would play to win. And now he wondered how he could consider doing anything else. Analyze the text. Team. What is the team the author is trying to convey to readers? How do you know? Journalism, literacy, and liberty. In The Boy Who Saved the Baseball. Some of the locals preparing for the big game were doubtless impressed by the arrival of national newscasters. Others, including Mr. Del Gato, were distressed. How dare those crass journalists and photographers descend in mass like that, pestering the players and fans for the sake of a few lines of copy? It takes more than a little grouchiness from the public, however, to keep the press from its appointed rounds. Whether the journalists involved are delivered news of critical importance to the nation or just providing a little entertainment through anecdotes of human interest. For hundreds of years, Humankind has read about the recent past in the words of journalists, reports, colonists, essays, bloggers, 
social media gurus and other. However, common such writing and reading may seem today, one needn't travel too far into the past to find a time when the news and indeed the written word itself was available only to the elite, to the very few, for the simple reason that most people for most of history could not read at all. Even if they had been literate, the masses of people could hardly have found a word to read. For the huge quantity of text we now see every day is relatively recent phenomenon. And if they had found a word or two to read, they might not have been free to read them. Precursors to the modern newspaper, the epitome of journalism and the most accessible form of news for generations, appeared about two millennia ago in ancient Rome. During the same time period, Chinese emperors, empresses, and other government officials were being briefed on current happenings via regularly published reports. However, both the Chinese and the Roman reports had to be copied by hand, therefore their circulation was severely limited, not just by the low literacy level of the populace, but also by the labor required to make multiple copies. Government censorship, too, played a major role in limiting the spread of the printed word. Rulers were reluctant to allow their subjects access to information that might make them rebellious. About 500 years ago, literacy levels among the general populace in many parts of the world began to rise dramatically. The invention of the printing press by Johannes Gutenberg in the 15th century, Germany sparked a revolution in the publishing or the making public of information and ideas. By 1500, several thousand printing presses were operating in Europe. As printed language spread, so did literacy, and as literacy spread, so did the desire for liberty, including the freedom to print and read as one chose, without censorship. Gutenberg's press was swiftly replicated and improved upon, and European publishers began distributing books by the millions. Then, approximately four centuries ago, newspapers for the general public began proliferating in many European cities, including London where one of the first daily newspapers emerged in the early 1700s under the masthead The Daily Current. In the same period, journalism began to establish itself in the American colonies, where at first most news items focused on information about London and the rest of Europe. Gradually, as independence-minded thought began to flourish in the colonies, newspapers became more local, less European in content. They began to focus on ideas and issues in the colonies themselves. Journalists and publishers, such as Benjamin Franklin, began using the press as a vehicle for not only news, but also witty commentary on issues of the day. The rest, as they say, was history. Journalistic freedom and relatively widespread literacy 
helped to fuel the flames of the American revolutionary spirit and ultimately lead to the founding of the most freedom-loving nation in the history of the world. In the words of America's most revered publisher, Without freedom of thought, there can be no such a thing as wisdom. And no such a thing as public liberty without freedom of speech. Benjamin Franklin, The New England Current, July 9, 1722